following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Transfiguration of the Bodhisattva Lecture related with the Sephira Hod Related with the development of the Bodhicitta <coughs> When we address the Gospels, we always uh, address the Tree of Life, which is a Kabbalah, which is a tool in order to comprehend not only the Gospels, but the whole Bible. Because the scriptures are rooted in Kabbalah. So, the lower Sephiroth, which we call the inferior quaternary, are related with the four Gospels. We already talked about Malkut, Related with Luke, Yesod, related with Matthew. Now we are entering into Hod, related with the Gospel of Mark, which is called the Gospel of Fire, symbolized by the lion. When we uh, Talk about fire. We have to bring into memory the exorcism of fire. The way in which we invoke the genii of fire in order to assist us in the comprehension of the light. Remember that <coughs> the Gospel of Mark start, starts like this, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And of course, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ is in Hod, which is the gospel of fire. In esotericism, when we invoke the genii of fire, we pronounce three genii, which are Mikael, Samael, and Anael. We state, Mikael, king of the sun, and of lightning. Samael, 
king of volcanoes and earthquakes. Anael, prince of the astral light. Our sisters, in the name of Christ, by the power of Christ and the majesty of Christ. This is how any Kabbalist pronounce the exorcism of fire related with Hod, which means glory, and which is related with the transfiguration written in the Gospels. When we explain these uh, Gospels or the path of the Bodhisattva, we always go to the three brains because the physical body indeed has three brains that uh, we had to master the intellectual brain, the emotional brain located in the area between the heart and the navel, and the sexual, instinctual motor brain located in the area of the genitals and coccyx. Here we find, of course, the three aspects or three fires that we are talking here, related with Hod. Michael is that name uh, of that archangel that rules the sun, the central of the solar system. And Michael means he who, who is like God. Of course, he who is like God is the solar mind. Remember that when the, we talk about the solar bodies that we have to create that the Bodhisattva has to elaborate, to develop in Yesod, we stated, according to the seven days of Genesis, that Netzach, the Sephira of the mind, is related with the fourth day of Genesis, in which we had to create the sun, which is, of course, related with the mind, the solar mind. We were mentioning in the previous lecture how uh, in the book of Daniel, the three young men who were, who were tested in the fire, in the furnace of uh, Nabucodonosor, and how they were not burned. But when Nabucodonosor were seen, the furnace and the three young men within the fire, he says in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So here, you find the same. Like the fourth is like the Son of God. He's referring, of course, to that particular Helios, that in the previous lecture, related with Matthew, we were talking about. We stated that Helios is the sun. And from that word comes that word uh, helium, <coughs> which is one of the main elements in the sun, solar force. 
And that's why we stated that when that uh, name Elijah is hidden, the solar force, that we had to manage to create in order to elaborate the true human being. So, in the Bible, the true human being is called man. We have to understand that when we pronounce the word man, we are not referring to the masculine sexual uh, gender. Masculine. It is referring to the mind. Because the word man comes from the Sanskrit manas. Which means uh, mind. That's why in Sanskrit when somebody has a solar mind, when somebody is a son of God, we call it manu. A manu is a son of God, a solar man. So the same word is used in English in order to describe that being. That is a man. But here we had to also emphasize our the word human, which as you see, also has the word man at the end. Human. But it has another word there that we always point, which is the word H-U-M, whom, we will pronounce hum, which is another Sanskrit word related with the wind, with the spirit. In Hebrew, for instance, when you talk about the spirit of the wind, or the wind, uh, we say it, Ruach. That's why in Genesis you find that word Ruach Elohim, which is translated as the Spirit of God. But also in the Gospels you find Jesus talking about the wind. And it says the Ruach bl- uh, blows. And they use, of course, the word Ruach in order to describe wind. At the same, this word Hume. Wind or spirit. But when we united hum and manas, we said human. Then we explain the word means the spirit related with the mind. Or that mind under the guidance, the guidance of the spirit. And here precisely we find uh, the word uh, that we were explaining in uh, describing in many lectures about the bodhicitta. Because we always state that the citta is the mind. But we have to understand that this mind that we are talking here is not the mind uh, that anybody, everybody has. That concrete mind with which we reason. Really, the chitta, because it's united with the word body, means a mind that has wisdom. That's why in Pistis Sophia, an illuminated mind is described as a wisdom of heart. This is how the Master Samael on the Lord transcribed the word bodhicitta, wisdom heart. Because the citta that we are talking here is the noose. In many lectures we explain that in the left ventricle of the heart we have that atom of the abstract mind which is called noose, N-O-U-S. So that is the citta. And of course, when that chitta is united with body, 
And then we have the bodhicitta. And remember that body, which means wisdom, is also uh, explained in Kabbalah, is related with the third sephira, chokmah, that in Hebrew means also wisdom. So this is the mystery of how chokmah, Christ, which is an energy, transform the individual, or we will say, creates, elaborates the auric embryo, the bodhicitta, that uh, in this uh, transfiguration, according to the Gospels, is related with two great prophets, which always are related with the Sephira Yesod, which is the Sephira related with water. Remember that there are two personages that appear in each side in the transfiguration of Jesus. That is Moses and Elijah. So here we have to visualize and to comprehend (coughs) who is Moses and who is Elijah. Remember that previously we explained that the great prophets, especially Moses and Elijah, are eons or aeons. Or I own, as others say, which means vehicles of Christic light that are cosmic, masters, in other words. They exist. We know that Moses is a great eon, a great master, as Elias, as Jesus, many other great masters. And uh, they represent, in each one of us, Something that we had to develop. That's why each one of them brought into the world their own wisdom, their own mission. Which is synthesized beautifully in the transfiguration of the Bodhisattva. Which is related with Hod. And which happened not only to Jesus of Nazareth who has the honor of uh, having the title of Christ, because he represented all the process of the Bodhisattva. I'll repeat again. The process of the Bodhisattva, the illumination or the enlightenment of the Bodhicitta, is written in the four Gospels. And is called, uh, or represented, in the life of the master Aberamento that people call in this day and age Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago to represent the path of the Bodhisattva in order to open the doors for everybody in order to become enlightened. So here we are explaining this and uh, Moses is precisely that uh, master that was the first prophet that appears according to the path in the Bible. It was written in the Gospels. All the prophets prophesied until John the Baptist. Because after that, the Son of Man has to appear. The law was given by all the apostles, by all the prophets. And of course, the first that appears given this law is Moses. But which law are we talking here? The law that we had to follow... And we have to discover by working in Yesod, 
Remember that Moses is that which is born from the waters. The name Moses in Hebrew, Moshe, is written with three letters. Mem, Shin, and He. Which means, gives the wisdom of how we had to be born from Mem, which in Kabbalah means water. And from Shin, which in Kabbalah is fire. And He, which is the womb. And that womb is always a nine sphere in which the master emerges. But this Moses is indeed willpower. That's why Moses works very hard in Egypt and also in Midian by taking care of the flock, the sheep. And when he gains the level of human being, the level of the fifth initiation of mayor mysteries, which is Tifereth, he goes up into the mountain. And there he found God. That Mount of Sinai, as we explain in different lectures, is a higher dimension. Everything that you find in the Bible or in the Old Testament about a mount, mountain, is always the higher dimensions. That's a symbol. Not only in the Bible, but in many other sacred books. Of course, the prophets, the great masters, use the name of the mountain in order to explain esotericism. Even in, Greek, in, in, in Greece, you find uh, Mount Olympus, where it's stated there where the God lives. But that Mount Olympus, of course, is not three-dimensional. It's a symbol of that which is the sixth dimension. And that, there is precisely where Moses found the burning bush, which is related, of course, with the aspect of the fire within the matter. When we were talking about the three genii of fire, we named Mikael, Samael, and Anael. Samael is the king of volcanoes and earthquakes. It is that fire which is called magma, which is the astral light within the matter. And that's why when we talk about the tree of knowledge, the burning bush, we see precisely that fire within the bush, within the matter. That fire is, of course, Christ. But also when we go up into the atmosphere, we find the sun, the solar energy, and the lightning that emerges from the clouds, when there's a storm, that lining that we see always in the storms are the solar light, electricity, the force in the atmosphere, which is also Christ. So that's Mikael in the earth. But that Mikael on the earth has to be in us as the mental body, solar body that we have to create. The manas, the human. So we have to understand here how these three genii, the third is Anael, the prince of the astral light, which works through the heart. Because obviously, in our physical body, in our three brains, Samael works in the magma of our own particular sexual force which is that that, uh, uh, that encloses the solar fire in our sexual matter while Mikhail is precisely that light that shines in the solar man that lining which is the wisdom that comes from that solar man represented in 
el Helios o Elijah. In an Ael, of course, which is the first ray of Venus, the positive ray of Venus, is related with love, with the emotional center. The three aspects in which we invoke the fire in order to work in us, in which are here represented by Elias, the head. That's why Elias says that he's the messenger of the sun, or the prophet of the sun. And that's why Eli, Jah, is called, my God is Jah. And that Jah, of course, is Keter. The crown. So, when you said, my God is Jah, you are saying that you are a human that your manas, your mind, which is solar, is under the service of your own particular jah, which is hume, the spirit, the ruach. And that's precisely what Elias represents, or Elijah, in, this, uh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And Moses represents the willpower that is being born from the sexual transmutation. Because the waters of Genesis, or the waters of the Jordan, or the waters of the river Nile in Egypt, are always a reference to the sexual creative power from which Moses emerged. Moses was saved by the water, or from the waters. He was taken from the waters. But Moses, of course, represents our own particular image, our own particular budata that grows, that develops under the guidance of willpower. In many lectures, I told you that this willpower is related with the pineal gland. The pineal gland is related with the chakra Sahasrara, which is called the crown chakra. And in Hebrew, Keter, the first sephira, is called crown. So, of course, the monad, the spirit, God, that which is our own being, works through the pineal gland in order to control the waters in Yesod. That's why you find here in the center of the tree of life Keter working through Da'at which is knowledge into Tifereth which is a human soul whose seat is in the pineal gland as well. When we talk about the human soul, we said the seat of the human soul is the pineal gland. So here is where you find how Keter, or the Chakra Sahasrara, works with the tree of knowledge, which is related with the assault, the sexual force, through willpower, which is Tiferet. But... That Tiferet willpower that was born from the water is Moses. And is Moses precisely the one that liberates the twelve tribes of Israel? A work that the Bodhisattva has to perform in order to create, to elaborate, the bodhicitta. Remember that we have stated as well in the previous lecture that the bodhicitta is related with what in Greek is named 
तो सोमा सुचिकंग In the previous lecture, the speaker was explaining how in Yesod we have the four ethers: the ether of life, the chemical ether, the luminous ether, and the reflective ether. Which are the four ethers located in the vital body, which is the superior part of the physical body. And that when we enter in this, in this knowledge, we have to learn how to divide, how to separate those ethers in order to create what the Greeks call to soma suchikon. Suchikon means from psyche, soul, and a gong, image. Icon. Yes, yes. Suchi icon. So the icon, yes, is precisely the image, which in Hebrew is called Thalem. T Z A L E M. Thalem. That Thalem or image, icon of God, is in Yesod. In other words, is in the sexual glands. And that's why precisely here you find the misunderstanding of people. Because it is obvious that physically we were created in the sexual act, which is Yesod. And they think that the image of God is physical, because we emerge from it. But they ignore that that image of God, really, that the Bible talks about, that God created the human being into his own image, is not the physical body. It's through that, through the knowledge of the transmutation. Because the Tosoma Suchikon, the image, is psychological. The word is called Psyche. Suchikon means Psyche and Icon. So then you find that that image of God that we are talking here is related with the two superior ethers. Which is called the luminous ether and the reflective ether. And that is precisely what is being born in Yesod when we separate the inferior waters from the superior waters. And that's a process a long process. Because Moses is the one that appears there at the beginning. That river Nile where the prince of Egypt or princess of Egypt takes that baby is precisely the sexual force. Taking Moses, saving Moses from the water means saving that icon, that Salem. And developing through the initiation. This is a process, of course, that goes here, up. This is what Moses represents. But this development of this Moses from the waters of Yesod is impossible without the guidance of Keter, the crown, without the guidance of the willpower. May thy will be one with mine. Or make my will made one with thine. You see, this is precisely the process of the bodhicitta, in which is being elaborated with the two superior ethers. And that's why when John the Baptist appear, appears in the river Jordan, a river because it's related with water, which is always Yasod. But this John the Baptist, of course, represents the already made man that was made from willpower, that was made from the law of Moses. 
many years precisely what in the previous lecture the speaker were explaining about the perfections how we had to start developing that we had to follow the law but we had to understand the law to comprehend the law of Moses which is the same law that we find in Buddhism with other names of course the law of Moses is related with the Ten Commandments given to the people to follow Ten Commandments to which you have to develop the virtues the elements, in order for the bodhicitta to appear in Yesod. That's why we stated in many lectures that when we talk about Yesod or the four beasts or Kerubim of Ezekiel, Yesod, the waters, is always represented by the image or the head of a human being. Because here that we are talking about the lion, which is Mark, is in relation with Hod. The eagle is in relation with Netzah, the face of the man with Yesod, and the bull with Malkut. Those are the four Kerubim, the four holy beasts that in Hebrew is called Hayot HaKadosh sacred, which are holding Keter, which is precisely that being that we have within that commands and controls our own psyche. So in other words, <coughs> we have to imitate Moses in order to perform the law. Moses follows the guidance of God, the will of God. And it's precisely in this, in this direction. From Egypt, which is Malkut, he goes into Yesod. And from Yesod into the Mount of Sinai, beyond that, which is Tifereth, where you find that, the burning bush. And Keter, of course, which is the head of the Holy Tree Unity, or Trimurti, or three, first triangle of the Tree of Life, appears in that. And that's why from that, Keter says to Moses, I am what I am. Or in other words, Eheye, Asher, Eheye. Go down to Egypt. Go down into the three-dimensional world, into Malkut, and liberate my people. This people is the people of Ish, Rael, which has many meanings. Isis, and Ra, which is the solar force in Egypt. Isis is the feminine force. And El is God. Or as others say, the Yod, which is Keter, working within Sara, Sara, in order for El to appear in the physical world, is Ra'el. There are twelve parts. Twelve parts that we had to pull from Klipoth. Because remember that underneath Malkut, we have hell, inferno, which in Kabbalah is called Klipoth, which is the inverted tree of life, within which we find the soul Botelat. Into all of those defects, vices, and errors that we have, The borichita, the embryo, uh, auric embryo, has to be born with all his powers, as Moses showed it in the book of Exodus. And of course, 
those powers emerge when he liberates all the parts of his being, which is called Israel. Because you find all the marvels and miracles that Moses performed in front of the Pharaoh is while he is dealing with his people. Little by little, he is performing all those wonders in order to go into the wilderness to the promised land. And in many lectures, we explain that the promised land is in Yesod. But in this case, in order to explain better, we have to emphasize that promised land is the two superior ethers, the luminous ether and the reflective ether. Because Egypt is related with the lower ethers. Remember that the chemical ether is related with the metabolism of the physical body, which is Malkut. And the ether of life is related with the sexual creative power in the physical body. So those two ethers are inferior, related to Malkut. The promised land is in Yesod, which is the other ethers above. But for that you have to separate the inferior ethers from the superior, or to separate the waters from the waters. And this is a task that can only be performed with willpower. In other words, that can only be performed with Moses. That's why when that is performed with all of the consciousness, when all of the essence is liberated by Moses, then you have Mo- Moses Sabaoth, or the army of God, in precisely joined as a bodhicitta. That's why Moses is called the liberator. He has to free, but that's willpower. In other words, willpower is necessary. Not only in order to create the true man, but in order to liberate the essence. That's why in Gnosticism we says our motto is Telema, willpower. Because without Telema, without willpower, it's impossible to create the human being within or to liberate the essence. But of course, that action that will power is exercise in the very sexual act. That's why the law of Moses is represented in the, in the two stone tablets of the law. He appears with two stones. This is, this, is, this is the law of God. In other words, this is the will of God. In symbolism, we see this. The law of our own particular individual monad, our own particular God, has to be performed with with two stone tablets. One is the man, and the other is the woman, united in the sexual act, in order to perform the Ark of the Covenant. Because that's the secret or the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of Noah, the performance of the sexual act, but not like the animals, because a true Kabbalist, a true magician, a true master, extracts the Zalem, the icon of God, from his or her own sexual glands, in order to elaborate within, with the two superior ethers, the bodhicitta. And that's the duty of Moses. In other words, we have to create, to elaborate, our own particular individual Moses. And that's precisely right. That's why Moses is in relation with the ninth sphere with the lower brain, 
when we find the forces of Lucifer, which we explain is the fire within the matter, the solar energy within the matter. We explain that in Greek mythology, this Lucifer is called Prometheus, and is the one that steals the fire of the sun, the solar light, and places it in the earth. Give it to men. Well, that fire is in the sexual organs. And it's called Lucifer in Latin. Prometheus in Greek. And that's why Master Samael on the earth states the wisdom of Moses, the doctrine of Moses is the doctrine of Lucifer. Light bearer. So by liberating this is how we are creating the true man with willpower. And uh, but remember that the chitta, the mind that we are talking here, which is not the mind that everybody has, is a mind that is abstract that we have to create. We have to elaborate. Because the mind that we have right now is bestial mind or bestial mind. And we explain it's in relation with the mark of the beast. In other words, the protoplasmic mind that we have in this day and age or anybody uses is a mind that you find in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the mineral kingdom, in different levels of evolution. But the mind that we are talking here Superior mind. In theosophy, they talk about two minds. The inferior manas and the superior manas. The superior manas is precisely this Moses that we are talking here. The superior manas is Tifereth, the human soul, the willpower. That is being elaborated from Yesod in different levels. But the development, the illumination of the wisdom that we had to develop within is elaborated within another prophet. Here is how we unite two beings in one. Elijah. Elijah is precisely that inferior manas. But not inferior in the sense like the mind that we have. But in the sense that is below Moses. Is the other type of mind which is Netzach. Which is called the solar mind. And as we explained in the beginning is represented by the sun. Because in the fourth day God created the sun, which is Michael, he who is like God, which is that fourth body in the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, who says the fourth one is like a son of God. Is that mind which is jealous? He wants to serve only the whom? It's Elijah. He says, My God is Jah. A mind under the service of the spirit. So we hold here two minds. Elijah and Moses. The two minds. But divine, superior. And elaborated in the process of transfiguration. Or transformation or permutation as we will say. That only can occur when we work with the bodhicitta. That's why you find that it's stated that John the Baptist appears in the Jordan, which is the Assad, the river Jordan, the waters, and that he is a reincarnation of Elijah, the prophet. We explained in the previous lecture how this Elijah is incarnated in the individual who is a true 
man. But a true man, that icon, that Suchi Kong, Tosoma Suchi Kong, is precisely uh, John the Baptist. That in the gospel states, all the prophets prophesize and give the law until John the Baptist. That meaning that all of that development of Moses doing the whole work ends until John the Baptist. In other words, until Elijah shines in Yesod. And that's another process, of course. Because when you study Moses and Elijah... You find the way in which you had to do that development. Moses is the liberator. And explains that Kabbalistically. To the Ten Commandments. But Elijah. Is that development. Of that we will call. That illumination. That enlightenment that emerges from within is that Buddha. Because also we recall here that in the fourth initiation of Mayor Mysteries, the monad, the spirit, receives the title of Buddha. But that Buddha is Elias. Is that sun that shines? Is Elijah? That works harder and harder against the Baalim. And here is precisely the reference in which we find how the inferior manas, under the guidance of God, has to work in the elaboration of that light within. By working against the Baalim. When you go into the Old Testament, you find the story of Elijah. And you find how he, Elijah, is against Jezebel. She who called herself a prophetess, is what the book of Revelation says. And if you want to read about that, she who called herself a prophetess is precisely in the fourth uh, church of the book of Revelation. Tiatira. Which is in relation with the heart. In which, in which we find, of course, the procedures in order to develop that heart, that sun that we are talking here, which is that light. You realize that? Hod is light, is the astral light. Christ is the solar light. And Elios, Elijah, is the messenger. Or in other words, the Borichita. As we explain, that the Bodhisattva has to grow within the psychological atmosphere of the Borichita. In other words, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man has to grow within the psychological environment of Elijah, which is represented by any man who has or who had worked with this, which is represented in John the Baptist. John the Baptist could be anyone that reaches that level. So, who is Jezebel? In this uh, Old Testament, Jezebel represents the animal mind. Jezebel represents this humanity, which in the Gospels are represented with, with another name. You see John the Baptist fighting against Herod, the king, who is married with Herodias. Same symbol. In other words, Herod represents that Jezebel, which is the animal mind, 
and her audio represents humanity. Because the mind, the intellectual mind, the animal mind that we have, is married with humanity, with this kind of uh, society, or civilization, which is made by the intellectual animal mind. And that's Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess. In this end, the gospel says that in this day and age will come false prophets. False prophets. All those related with that mind, which is Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, but is not. And of course, Jezebel worshipped Baal. In Hebrew, Baal means Mr., Sir. But there is another word, which is called Adonai, which means Lord. Similar, right? But Adonai is the sacred name of God in Malkut, according to the Tree of Life. Why Baal, which is always negative, is in relation with Klipoth, the lower Malkut. So Jezebel works and worships the Baalim. Who are the Baalim? Those that worship with the intellectual mind, the Baal. The mechanicity of nature. Related with Klipoth. So there you find that the Baalim are related with what in the other lecture we said is the beast that the book of Revelation talks about. The beast that emerges from the abyss, from Klipoth, and that has seven heads and ten horns. We explain that the seven heads are lust, anger, pride, envy, greed, laziness, gluttony. That's the name of the beast. But it has ten horns, which means the ten sephirot. So that beast, the ten sephirot, inverted in Klipoth. So those ten horns, or ten rays, negative forces from Klipoth, give a strength to the beast of the seven heads, which everybody carries within. And which in the book of Kings, related with Elijah, is synthesized in Jezebel. Because Jezebel is stated there that has 450 Baalim, or prophets of Baalim, which Elijah annihilates. It's stated there that Elijah uh, burns them or, or kills them in a mount. If you read the book of Kings, uh, chapter 18, it's explained there with a lot of details. The battle between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baalim, which is a battle that we had to have within. 450 makes the addition of 9, which is Jesod. In other words, the way in which the mind works with the negative forces or, the, or, or fornication, negative uh, sexual degeneration, in other words. That's Baal. So you find there that is Elijah is that solar mind. When the initiate reaches that level, when he has created already astral body, mental body, and causal body, and is already a complete human being, he has to fight against the Baalim. That's the first task. And that's why John the Baptist is decapitated. Because the head represents precisely that Jezebel, or that Herod, that Herodias, or that Salome. Salome represents the wisdom of good and evil that we had to develop. But in the process. So you see here how Elijah is developed within 
<coughs> so that Elijah is the solar mind that shines in the fourth day of Genesis. And that is only the service of Jah, the inner God. But of course, we have to be very jealous with our own particular individual inheritance. Because when we talk about Hod, we are talking here about our own particular individual inheritance. In the tree of life, in the world of Yetzirah, Hod is the world of the Beni Elohim. Beni Elohim means the children of the gods and goddesses. So, of course, there are many children in the earth as Elohim in heaven. In other words, each one of us has his own particular individual Elohim or monad or spirit that we're talking here. But of course, each one of us has his own inheritance, his own light. You have to admit and comprehend, understand that each master has different light. It is enough to read the Quran in order to see the light of Muhammad, the wisdom of Muhammad. But if we go into the Gospels or into the Pistisophia, which is the Gnostic Bible, we see the wisdom of Master Averamento. It's, it's another light. And when we read the books of the Master Samael on the Or, we see another light. When we read the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna, we see another light. You see the same wisdom, but shown with different lights. Buddha, for instance, the wisdom of Buddha, or the wisdom of Zoroaster. Each master develops different light, because we have different inheritance, cosmic inheritance of Christ. Christ, as we stated, is a multiple perfect unity, the astral light. And that's why you see Jesus transfigured in Hod, in the astral light, in the mount, which is precisely the fifth dimension, the astral light, in showing his light. That transfiguration happens to all masters, means the wisdom, the knowledge. How the master transfigure himself according to his own inheritance. That's why in this uh, physical world we were baptized with certain name that our father or mother had the occurrence to say, hey, name him this Peter. No, no, let's say, name him Joseph or Richard, any name. But of anyhow, that name, you know, is just, uh, how you call, uh, an accident of life. And surnames. But the real name that we have is in the spirit. Each one of us has his own particular individual name. And that name encloses the wisdom of your own inheritance. That's why when you read the name Samael on the or, and then you really found there the inheritance of the master Samael on the or. In Hebrew, on the or means strength and light. You see how the master is a, is a strength, has power and light in order to teach. And Samael is the king of fire. Volcanoes and earthquakes. It's a very strong master. So in the meaning of the word, of the name of his own particular being, is hidden the wisdom. And that's precisely where we have to understand. Each one of us has to develop that. Our own particular inheritance. That's why Master Samai always says, you have to follow your own being, to develop your own inheritance. 
your own wisdom, according to your, the level or the degree of objective reasoning. And that's precisely placed in Hod. You see, Hod is precisely the astral light. And it's precisely the place where we find the Eidolon, the astral body that we have to create. And that astral body is called our own particular individual Jesus Christ. That's why when we enter into the wisdom of the Son of God, the Beni Elohim in Hod is the wisdom of Jesus Christ. The wisdom of the fire. And here is where you find that John the Baptist is baptizing with water, with the knowledge that we are giving here. Because this is Elijah. John the Baptist is Elijah preaching, showing the wisdom of his own God. But it says, in the middle of you are one that is going to develop that particular wisdom in yourself. And that is your own particular individual hod. Your astral Jesus Christ that is being born. That is the son of man. Are you following me? I hope because we are entering, they will ask, ask us to enter into the wisdom of the Gospels. But the Gospels are related with the path of the Bodhisattva. The development of that within. And that's why in the third initiation of Mayor Mysteries is the first time when you receive the name of your own particular individual God. And when you receive that, you already know the name, the real, the true name that you have since the beginning of creation. Since the beginning of eternity. That's your name. And that's why we said the Master Aberamento, which is the name, the second name of the Master Jesus. They call it Jesus of Nazareth or, or Yeshua ben Pandira or Yeshua ben Pander. But that's according to time, according to the, the scriptures. But his real name is Aberamento. So each one of us has that name in Hod. And that name is the word, the astral force that attracts that particular inheritance. From the cosmic Christ. Christ is not individual. It's a universal force. It's energy. But descends and develops, unfolds in different dimensions and shines in Hod. It's the astral light. And coagulates in the physical body as the sexual matter. And shines in the head of the solar mind. That's why when we're talking about here, Anael, prince of the astral light. And the master Samael states that in order to develop that son of man inside of us, in order to develop that son of God, that Christ within, we have to do it through the Venustic Initiations. Venus. The Venustic Initiations are related with the development of that Christ, that love in the heart, which is Nus. Because that Nus, which is in the left vertical of the heart, controls. Or in other words, we will say, Moses which is willpower, is controlled or receive the guidance of the monad through nous, the heart. The heart is precisely that we always have to follow because through the atom nous, willpower, exercise, dominion, 
over the physical body. And of course, it's through news, through the heart, through which Elias also receives commands and guidance in the work. And that's why the work of the heart is meditation. Hmm? Only through meditation is how we get in contact with our own particular individual Son of God. Because in Hod is where we find the Beni Elohim. This Son of God is news that is developing through initiation. When we are reaching here the transfiguration of that particular astral body, it's a transfiguration of that monad in the astral body. And of course, that news that develops there is the authentic bodhisattva. Remember that sattva is in relation with knowledge, and body is chokhmah, wisdom. Is a son of God. That's why in many Kabbalistic books of initiates, illuminated masters, they name the son of God the atom nus. But that atom nus is in relation with the astral body. And that transfigured completely by understanding the law of his own particular individual God. And by teaching that law with a lot of jealousy. And so you find that precisely among uh, the great masters, like the master Samael on the or. He says, I am just teaching here the uh, wisdom of my God. But he is utilizing his own particular Elias, his own illuminated mind, because he is a Buddha, an enlightened one. And he is utilizing his willpower, action, in order to do it. That's Moses and Elijah. Do you understand that? You have to elaborate, you have to create your own particular Moses, your own particular Elias inside, and to place them under the service of your heart, which is the atom news, the Son of God. And that's why when Jesus is going to pass through that initiation, what is going to transfigure, which means that all of that wisdom is going to appear in front of him. He takes three disciples. He doesn't take two, not one, but three. Because each one of them represents something within that we have to develop. He takes Peter. We explain in other lectures that Peter, the apostle, is related with the pineal gland. Peter is willpower. Is that willpower that we developed and to whom the atom nous gives the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Says, Whatever you do, open or close, will be open or will be closed in heaven. Heaven, of course, is our head. And Peter is here in the pineal gland. And Peter, the pineal gland, through the hormones, control the sexual hormones in Yesod. And that's why you see here, there, that without Peter, nobody can go to the transfiguration. Peter, of course, in this case, in, in, in a relation with Moses, which is willpower. With the human soul. Different. But we have another disciple. Which is called John. John. Which is the youngest of all the apostles. And in other lectures we explain that John is related with the thymus gland. The thymus gland is behind the heart. That's why John is always representing resting his head. On the heart of Jesus. Always you have to understand that the head, the brain, the intellectual brain, is a physical vehicle of the mind, of that manners. But that John represents the essence, the burata, which is ruled by the moon. Because the thymus gland is ruled by the moon, and the moon is related with the sod. So then you find there that that John is precisely that burata, that essence, 
that is being developed. That's why it's also called John, the Word, united with, with, with Jesus. And that's why when Jesus is on the cross, remember, Jesus looked at John and says, look at your mother, who is his mother. And the mother uh, to his mother says, look at your son. And from that moment it says that John took Mary as his mother. But that is a, mix, a, a, a mystery of the transformation of that thymus gland with the heart. Because Jesus is in the atom nuisance in the heart, while John is in the thymus gland. And of course, that transfiguration is related, of course, with the bodhicitta. Which in this case is the John, John, there. Because remember that that transfiguration appears and Elias appear there. But that Elias is the spirit of John the Baptist. Because was reincarnated in John the Baptist. But he appears after the decapitation. Because if you read the gospel you will find that how John the Baptist was in prison and decapitated. He dies. In other words, the mundane terrestrial man is dead already. Psychologically speaking. Because we have to understand that when we talk about death, we're talking about psychological death. The process inside of initiation. And then Elias appeared there. Because the physical entity that was John the Baptist dealing with Herod, with Herodias, with Salome, and all that, is already dead. But Elias is there. Meaning that it's a transformation already happened. And is transfigured. It's given unto his own particular individual God that level. That wisdom. And that's when Jesus appeared... After that transfiguration, teaches about the law of Moses and with a lot of jealousy in relation with God, his inner being, his inner father, that Elijah, that is Elijah. The other disciple that is taken into the mount with John and Peter is James, which is the brother of uh, John. James, as we explain, is in relation with the pancreas. With this area of the stomach, close to the heart, where we have all these negative appetites, animalistic, that we have to overcome. If you read the gospel or the epistle, the letter of James, you will find there how James pronounces itself against the negative things of the heart and the tongue. And Jesus explains in the gospel that the tongue speaks what is coming from inside the heart. But that is, of course, the negative emotions that we had to overcome in order to elaborate that particular individual uh, wisdom inside. You see, the tongue expresses always negative emotions. We talk about here about many negative emotions that we had to eradicate. Fear, for instance, is one of those emotions. That's why. When Master Jesus is in the Sea of Galilee with all of his disciples in that storm and he's sleeping in the ship and the storm is breaking up. He awakes and says, why are you afraid? If I am with you. But unfortunately, we are afraid always and we express a lot of fear because in this area of the stomach, we have a lot of negative emotions. Fear, jealousy, self-esteem. And uh, those emotions that turn us into negative uh, individuals. 
and that we uh, waste a lot of energy. So when we, of course, overcome that, we are transfigured. Do you see, in other words, the transfiguration is related with that, because hot is in relation with the heart. Superior emotions. But in order to transfigure, in order to acquire that inheritance of our own particular God in the astral body, in our own particular astral body that we had to create, we had to overcome negative emotions. If we do not conquer our own particular individual negative emotions, we will not create the astral body, which is our own particular individual Jesus Christ, our own particular individual Messiah, Son of God, the Son of Man, that has to come to baptize us with fire. That's why in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus appears, as we explained in the other lecture, he comes from Yeshua after defeating Satan in his temptations. While the Gospel of Mark says he was with wild beasts and the angels were serving him. The angels of Hod, of course, are the Beni Elohim that serve him in order to develop. But after that, he goes and starts collecting his disciples in the Sea of Galilee. And he's teaching us that in order to be a disciple of Christ, we have to be a fisherman. What is to be a fisherman? Kabbalistically, you already know that the fish symbolizes noon. And that noon is precisely that seed within which the image of God is inside. That noon is a sperm in the man and the ovum in the woman. When we extract that fire, that icon, that salem, that image of God, we are becoming fishermen. It's not like the people think, like the first disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were doing something there in, in the Sea of Galilee. It might, they may like, because I like to fish too. You know? But it doesn't mean literally that they were fishermen. It means that they were working with the waters. Because in order for you to be a fisherman, you go into the waters, into a boat. You cannot fish in the land. You have to need water. And that water is Yesod, the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan, the River Nile, any type of water. And he says, well, now that you are uh, already conquering Yesod, because you are fishermen... You are fishing from your own waters. Now I want to, you to become fisher of men. Fisher of manas, in other words. And that's why he finds Peter, which is in the Pina gland. And he finds uh, the brother of Peter, who is Andrew, related with the superrenals. Both are related with the sexual energy, the waters of energy. Because the kidneys control the waters of sex in the pineal gland as well. And then he finds John, which is the thymus gland, in relation with what we're explaining here. You know that the moon rules, yes, odd. And this is how John, that Buddha, develops inside of us, that psyche. It's precisely the importance of knowing about sexual alchemy in order to transfigure ourselves in a moment and to receive that wisdom. Because it's precisely what we want. We want to understand the wisdom of God. We want to understand the knowledge of God. But we have to comprehend that within the astral body is the mind, is Elias, shining, and that Elias is the one that comprehends the language of God. You have to elaborate. You have to create that. Otherwise, you fall into the mistake of following your own particular Jezebel that reads the Gospels literally and interprets them literally. 
And that Jezebel, in the head of many millions of people, called herself a prophetess. But she, she doesn't not, not understand that. Because in order, in order to understand the wisdom of God, you have to be a Kabbalist. You have to develop your own Elijah. Your own mind has to be on the service of God. And in order to do that, you have to follow the law of God, which is your own individual Moses, meaning that you have to use your willpower in order to create within your own Elijah. And when that is created, then you transfigured. In the third initiation of Mayor Mysteries, which is the path of the Bodhisattva, And this is how these two minds, the superior mind, Moses, Tifereth, and the inferior mind, Elias, Netzah, are in each side of Jesus, which is Nus, that divine mind that controls both. That's why when they come down from the transfiguration, Peter says, Sir, we should make two tents, two tabernacles here. One for Elias, one for Moses, and one for you. And then they hear a voice coming from the clouds saying, Nus, this is my beloved son, whom I well pleased. Hear him. This is precisely what I had to do. Our own particular mind, our own particular willpower has to follow always the fires of the heart. From the beginning until the end. This is what Keter says, you see. Keter says that through the cloud, which is the mystery, because a cloud symbolizes always a mystery. This is my beloved son in the Heart, the left ventricle of the heart. Listen to him. Then you will not be misguided. Because that is intuition. The voice of God. And if, you're, if Elias is following that, and if Moses is following that, you have to do it too. And when you create those elements within you, it has to be always through the heart. That's precisely the initiation. The initiation is through the heart. Because the fires of the heart controls the fires of Moses and the fires of Elias. Which is the mind and the sexual force. Here you understand why we emphasize always about this chastity. Because without chastity, without scientific chastity, we cannot elaborate anything. Remember that chastity is not sexual abstinence, but the way in which put in, we put in activity the sexual energy through pranayama or through the saha maituna by following the law, the rules, the Ten Commandments in other words. And for that, you can go into the website and study the Ten Commandments, which are in reality 12 now that we put there, in order to understand how you had to follow that and to comprehend, because that's the way to create your own particular Moses. If you awake completely, then you won't need to hear any lecture, because you will follow the, the, your own particular God, the law of your own God, as Moses did. Being face to face to God and God is talking to him. But for that you have to go consciously in the sixth dimension. Where is that? To hear the voice of your own God. If you are guided by your own God, no problem. But before that, that's why Deuteronomy, the written law for those that are still asleep. Do you have questions? Moses climbing the Red Sea, 
Moses, of course, parting the Red Sea and taking all the Israelites to the Red Sea into the Promised Land is the beginning of the work in which we have to reject the passional fires of the Red Sea. That's the symbol. The animalistic, lustful fires of sex that everybody has and to divide it and to pass there to go into the process of transformation. That's just the beginning. And of course, if you understand, uh, we need meditation, comprehension in order to transform that. Because the Pharaoh and all of his soldiers symbolize all of those elements. Which in this case, in the story of Elijah, are the Baalim that we have to conquer. To kill. But that's inside. Not outside. Because everything, every story in the Bible is symbolic. And this is how, of course, uh, when Jesus appears, the Bodhisattva appears, transfigured in the astral, is because all this work has been done already. We pass already the Red Sea. We already were decapitated. Seven times. In order for Elijah to appear. Without the capitation, there's no way that we want one uh, passes for the transfiguration. That the capitation happens through the fire seven times. And that John is the capitated seven times because John, as we said, is represented E A O U A M S, the seven vowels. And then the, when one is decapitated, it is because already passed through the Buddhist annihilation. And the transfiguration happens. In the beginning, of course, when the initiate is receiving the third initiation of the light, when the third viper of light is rising in the astral body, he transfigures. And he understands about the law of Moses. And about Elias, his own particular son, as you But later on in time, he has to qualify that third initiation. And in order to qualify that, he has to annihilate completely the ego. Because in order for the astral body to shine completely, you have to be there without desires. All the animalistic elements within you have to be annihilated. So it's a long process. That's why we have always work to work with negative emotions, transforming them with desire from the beginning. And this is how we are advancing little by little. And we need a lot of patience. Patience is necessary. In this work. Is that where now Moses strikes the rock with the staff and the waters come out? Doesn't he get reprimanded for that by God later? Well, during the process when the, we utilize willpower and went to extract the waters from the rock of the Assad, sometimes we do it with lust. Because we still have ego there. And of course, the consequences are always uh, reprimanded, right? Mm. Remember the story there that the Israelites are uh, asking for water, I believe, right? And Moses do it. I mean, those Israelites are calling the inferior parts of our consciousness. We still are in process. So willpower always, of course, unfortunately, when willpower is bottled up within the ego, it's called desire. And in the beginning, although in the process of transformation, 
the alchemist takes the water from the rock, unfortunately, with lust. Because we have lust. This is what Paul of Tarsus says. We begin as animals and we end as spiritual. First is the animal, then the spirit. So when we start in doing this, since we are more animal than spirit, obviously we start as animal. But we are transmuting, transmuting until we are utilizing the energy. Of course, our God is not pleased when we work in the transformation of the sexual energy with lust. But if the lust is there, what can we do? Just to meditate and comprehend. Because we would like to practice uh, Sahamaituna, sexual magic, with a lust. But uh, if we can take the lust and say, okay, my lust, get out of me right now because I'm going to practice sexual magic. But that's impossible. Your lust will be there, present. And that's something that you have to endure. That's why you have to meditate against your balim. You have to be jealous of your own wisdom, of your own God. And to annihilate little by little all those degenerated entities that dwell within our psyche. Do you have any other question? The question is if that inheritance is in relation with past lives or the way in which we reincarnated. No. That uh, elaboration of uh, the memory or the remembrance of the awakening of the consciousness related with past lives, which is the subconsciousness, it is only the memory of our past reincarnation which comes when you awake, when you meditate in your own ego, when you develop those powers. But the inheritance that we are talking here is a portion of the light from Christ. Because remember that the Lord gives his abundance. He's all a light. But he gives, distributes his light in different ways. And that's precisely there's a hierarchy. We, in our own particular monad, Christ placed the inheritance that we have. But that inheritance is in potentiality, not in activity. If we want to put it in activity, we have to pass the, the path of the Bodhisattva, the initiation. And then that inheritance shows, shines in the astral body because the astral body is the son of God, is the Beni Elohim, the one that receives that inheritance. When I explain this, it's coming into my mind the two children of uh, Isaac, which is Jacob and Esau. Esau. Isa, yeah, Isa. Jacob and Isa. Who receives the inheritance? According to the the dissension of the tree of life is Netzah, right? Which is Isa. But of course, that's a symbol of the mind. Here, that in, the, in this aspect, is the mind, which is still has ego. Yes, Isa is a hunter. And the mind always likes to hunt. In order to get titles, diplomas, in order to be fame, this is precisely that Jezebel, that Isa, inside of us. Go and do this, do that, be famous, get money, get power, right? And that's why Isa always sells his first right, his inheritance, for a plate of uh, lentil, meaning for bologna in Italian, it's better. He sells that for bologna, which is the world, you know, this, the mind is always identified with this society. Oh, I want to be the American Idol. Oh, I want to be or the Asian Idol, whatever. They want to be always to be famous. Or well, master. Oh, I want to, to say that, that I'm here the master such and such. Worship me. Right? I am this, I am that. And, and this is precisely the mind that we have to conquer. It's Satan, in other words. 
He's always selling the birthright, the inheritance. That's why the inheritance falls into Jacob, which represents Hod, which is the son. You see? We should receive it, of course, inheritance in the mind, but you know, the mind is precisely that gives us a lot of trouble. That's the two precisely, the twins, according to the Bible, is the astral body and the mental body. Jacob in Isa. The mind is Isa. Just Cain as well. It's represented in many ways. So, your inner particular individual monad, God, won't give you your inheritance if the devil is living within you. Because God won't give his powers to the devil. If you have lust, anger, hatred, laziness, gluttony within, within you, don't even dream that you want to receive your inheritance. First, you have to elaborate the astral body and to annihilate the Baalim, the unloyal ones, the unfaithful ones, the unbelievers which are within you. Then you receive your inheritance. Then you transfigure it completely. Before that, work hard yourself. Transfigure yourself, which is a permutation that you had to, allow, uh, to perform. And that's the mystery, of course, of the transfiguration of the Bodhisattva, which is represented in Jesus of Nazareth, where he, particular individual, transfigured in front of his disciples. But that happens not only to Jesus, that happened to Krishna, that happened to Buddha, that happened to Moses, that happened to many. And when that transfiguration is done, then the wisdom, the knowledge of that particular master shuns. Shines, I mean. Right? And this is what you find. If you want to see the light, the transfiguration of Moses, well, read the, the, the Torah. That's his light. And each master has a book where he shows his own light. But uh, the best is to elaborate your own particular individual light. To transfigure by yourself. And that's a process of initiation. There is no uh, other, lec uh, other question. Lectures, yeah, will be next. No questions? Thank you very much. Oh, is there a question there? No. Thank you very much. And see you next uh, Saturday for the lecture related with Netza in relation with Buddhism. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,